Confidence can get you anywhere. The idiom is simple enough, and simply means that those who project themselves as being confident are able to do so more than those who don't appear so. Let's say you were trying to sneak into a festival. All of your friends are going, but you weren't able to get tickets. So you and your friends devise a plan. They will all go inside first and get their wristbands for the event. But once inside, one of your friends will take off their wristband, and another friend, still wearing theirs, will walk out and give you the spare one. The plan should work, should you both appear confident and not draw attention to yourself. The beginning stages of the plan go perfectly. They walk in, no issue. But you, sitting outside of the gates, begin to get nervous. You have the feeling that people are staring at you, like they know what you're about to do, and out of fear, you begin to stare at security. You anxiously keep looking at them, trying to see if they've noticed you, and because of your suspicious gaze, they have. This makes you even more frazzled. You begin to wring your hands and try to look comfortable, but you can't help yourself. You feel like now, everyone around you knows what you're up to, and everything you do is making you look worse. Finally, your friend comes out of the venue with the spare wristband in their pocket. They greet you with a smile and seem calm and collected, but immediately, they sense that something is off about you. They notice the security already looking at you, and they see how pale you've gotten. There's no way for you to put the wristband on here, so they try to get you to calm down, to go on a short walk with them, so you can relax and go through the gate with no issue. But it's already too late. You've attracted the security's attention, and now they know what you two are up to. But had you appeared self-assured and confident, chances are you wouldn't have attracted all of that negative attention. You could have just walked into the event with the wristband and your friends with no issue. There are countless ways that this kind of unseen confidence can help people in their daily lives. But in today's case, we will watch as a person lets their confidence destroy them and their life. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Richard Merritt and how this disgraced lawyer thought he would get away with his crimes by taking the stand. This case was recommended to us by someone who purported to be close to Richard in his youth, and after my brother and I researched this case, it's easy to see why they thought this would make for an interesting video. As always, if there is a case you're interested in us covering, feel free to let us know in the comments down below, or email us at dreading.official at gmail.com. We're constantly adding new cases to our backlog, responding to emails, and corresponding with those involved. So if there's a case you feel that we need to pay more attention to, let us know. If you're interested in seeing these videos as soon as they're finished, our Patreon is linked down below. We're constantly adding new videos over there, and currently, the next month's worth of videos are available to be watched at your leisure. Our Patreon is how we're able to make this content consistently, as YouTube regularly demonetizes our channel. But to be clear, even if our channel was fully demonetized, we would still post the majority of our videos here for public consumption. But with all of that said, let us begin. According to those who knew him, Richard Merritt was an egotistical man. Upon first introduction, most people would state he was charming. He could make you feel like the most important person in the room, simply because he, a self-identified, incredibly successful lawyer, was paying attention to you. But that charm quickly wore off. He seemed to be in a constant competition with himself and others, always looking to one-up anyone he believed was doing better than him. On multiple occasions, when someone he knew was talking about a promotion they received or some accolade that they had just gotten, Richard would get noticeably frustrated, seething at the idea that someone was doing better than he was. Usually, this would result in him lying to the other person, claiming that he too got a huge salary bump, one that was always slightly larger than the other person's. But his ego also led him to getting violent. His ex-wife would describe how Richard, upon not getting his way, would fly off the handle. His behavior was akin to a three-year-old throwing a tantrum in a supermarket after being told they couldn't get what they wanted. The hysterics, the aggression, and the willingness to cause damage to those around him all matched a child's bad behavior. But they were amplified by the fact that he was an adult man. Richard boasted about his career as a lawyer and how he was set to be one of the most successful in his area and from public appearances, he wasn't lying. He took on multiple civil lawsuits, usually around elder abuse and medical malpractice, which made him incredibly wealthy. With the money his work brought in, he was able to buy himself a Porsche and go on multiple lavish vacations with his family, usually purchased to try and make up for a violent outburst he had around them. But public appearances weren't everything. Richard's success came at a great cost to his clients, as he would often settle their cases without informing them and take the money from the settlement for himself. He would then pretend that he was still working on their cases, claiming that civil lawsuits take a long time. 
and hoping that his elderly clients would perish before getting suspicious. In multiple instances, he continued to charge a client well after their case had been settled, which cost the client thousands of dollars that they didn't have. Richard kept his theft a secret from everyone in his life, choosing to state he was just that good at being a lawyer. Eventually, two of his clients caught on to his fraud, and they contacted the authorities, providing concrete evidence that he had stolen their money. At first, Richard told his wife that this had all been a giant misunderstanding, and that he had done nothing wrong. He informed her that these clients were unsatisfied with his work, and that instead of moving on with their lives after losing a case, they made it their mission to destroy him. A warrant was issued for his arrest, and he reported to the county jail, where he was immediately bailed out by his wife, believing that within a few weeks, everything would be cleared up. However, when word got out that Merritt had defrauded at least one of his clients, his other clients began to look at their records more closely, and found that they, too, had been victims of his scheme. Within a few months, more than 17 different people had been identified as having been victimized by his fraud, and he was once again arrested. After Richard informed his wife of the truth, she immediately divorced him and took full custody of their two children. She moved them out of their family home, fearing that Richard would try to lord it over their heads and force his way back into their lives, and she made a direct apology to all the victims, stating she was unaware of where the money was coming from. Without his wife's paycheck or the ability to find work for himself, Merritt was forced to move back in with his mom, Shirley. Shirley Merritt was known for being an extremely kind and generous woman taking special care to put others before herself. She worked in patient and family services at Children's Health Care of Atlanta, and former patients would remember her for always making them smile, whether that be with her humor or with her baked goods. On a number of occasions, Shirley would bring whole cakes to work, handing out slices to her patients and colleagues, knowing that the current patients weren't exactly there voluntarily. By February 2017, Marin would admit to knowingly stealing $75,000 from his clients and voluntarily surrendered his license after being disbarred. As he awaited trial, the courts ordered that he wear an ankle monitor at all times, which he happily accepted. He hoped his compliance would lead to him being offered a deal, but the investigation into his fraud continued, and eventually it was found he stole nearly $500,000 from 17 different clients. Merritt would also forge the signatures of many of his clients on checks, and then cash them for himself. Merritt's guilty plea would result in him being sentenced to serve 15 years in prison, followed by 15 more on probation, which Merritt himself seemed to take on his chin. He told his lawyer as well as the judge that he accepted his sentence, as he had made a grave error in conduct, and planned on being a model prisoner. He was told to report to prison on February 1st, 2019, and in the days leading up to it, he was allegedly in good spirits. His lawyer would state that, quote, days before he was to turn himself in and begin serving his sentence, Mr. Merritt sounded upbeat and optimistic about his chances of parole after serving just five years, unquote. However, he would never report to prison. Instead, on January 31st, Richard would violently attack his mother in their shared home after she made food for him. What prompted this attack is unknown, but according to the autopsy, Shirley was stabbed repeatedly with a kitchen knife in her face, neck, and torso. The frenzied stabbing also ended after the knife blade was lodged into her head, and the handle was discarded on the kitchen floor. Following the stabbing, her head was beaten further with a 35-pound dumbbell, and her body was thrown down the stairs of the home into the basement. Following the attack, Richard stole his mother's car before cutting off his ankle monitor. He then proceeded to go on the run for the next eight months, hoping to avoid jail time altogether. When Shirley Merritt's body was found, the police were able to quickly surmise what had happened. Stressed about his impending prison sentence beginning, Richard made a choice to go on the run instead of facing the consequences for his actions. He killed his mother savagely, stole her car and some of her possessions, then left to start a new life for himself. A manhunt quickly began. The crime scene investigators were able to find evidence of his involvement in the murder. His DNA was present on the dumbbell that had been used to bash in his mother's head, and his DNA had been present at the scene, but notably no fingerprints were able to be matched on the knife that had been used as the frenzied attack only left partial prints. Merritt would eventually be caught eight months later, living in Tennessee, where he went by the alias Mick Malveaux. He immediately joined multiple dating sites and came up with different backstories for himself, including stating that his mother had recently passed away from leukemia. He had begun a semi-serious relationship with a woman when he would be arrested and brought in, this time for the murder of his mother. In court, 
Richard refused to back down, stating he was innocent of any wrongdoing and that he was the real victim in all of this. He would claim that he didn't murder his mother, but he witnessed her murder. According to his story, two armed men came into the home and attacked his mother in front of him. He claimed that these men were motivated by his crimes and wanted to get revenge on him, so instead of harming him or shooting them both, they violently killed his mother in front of him. Merritt then claimed the two gunmen, who never used their guns, if he ever uttered a word about what had happened, they would kill his ex-wife and two children. He says that is why he fled to Nashville to start a new life. So let's see how that obviously fictional story goes over. The evidence in this case is beyond damning. No one else's DNA was found in the home. Merritt immediately went on the run and didn't call emergency services for his mother, and he had an incredible stressor to serve as a motive. But he insists that he wasn't responsible. This is an impossible task, but in order to make his version of events seem plausible, he will have to appear completely incapable and incompetent while on the stand. The jury has to believe that he isn't capable of causing harm to his elderly mother, and that his going on the run was a choice made out of fear or a mental break. So let's see how he does. Next, Your Honor, the defense calls Mr. Richard Merrick to the stand. Sir, you're right. You swear, brother. I do. All right, and he's already failed. So much of taking the stand in your own defense is based on presentation. You need to seem as defenseless and incapable of the crimes you were accused of as possible. And in this case, because Richard made multiple obvious attempts to get away, he should be attempting to seem timid, afraid, stressed, and a bit mentally incompetent. We want to be able to look at him and see someone who wouldn't think through their actions and would make a stupid decision out of fear. But instead, he seems pompous and arrogant. His lips are pursed. And when swearing in, he raises his eyebrows, which makes his attitude seem smug. In every other portion of his life, his confidence was seen as an asset. But here, it actively works against him. What's your, state your name, Mr. Merritt? Uh, Richard Vincent Merritt. And Mr. Merritt, where were you born? Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And did you grow up in Virginia? Well, initially, um, so the first three years of my life there, my father was in the Air Force. He was career Air Force. He actually retired as a, a bird colonel after 24 years of service. But at the time I was born, um, we were stationed there. I believe he was at the Pentagon. We stayed there for about three years. When I was three years old, we moved to Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. Stayed there for another three years. And went back to D.C. where we stayed until I was 13 when my father retired. And at that point, he took a job with McDonnell Douglas, which back then was one of the world's largest military aircraft manufacturers. We went and lived overseas in Saudi Arabia for two years. At that time, you could not attend school past the ninth grade in Saudi Arabia. So um, I came back and actually went my sophomore year at the Paideia School here in DeKalb County. And then my dad was transferred to St. Louis to company headquarters where I spent my junior and senior year of high school. So I moved around a lot. Firstly, the majority of the information he just gave is absolutely useless in regards to his testimony. However, his response is interesting, as it shows how Richard will take a simple question like, did you grow up in this area, and manipulate the question to brag about himself in some way. Secondly, his answer still works against him in what he is attempting to do here. The type of person who becomes so flustered at a crime scene that they go on the run for eight months to begin leading a new life out of fear is not the kind of person to sit calmly on the stand and recount their life story like this. His voice is steady. His mannerisms indicate that he believes that his life story makes him better than those listening. And when placed next to what he's accused of doing, it makes him appear callous and heartless. What's your father's name? He went by Ken, but his full name was Robert Kenneth Merritt. And... When did your father pass? He passed away in November of 2000. Obviously, your mother's name was... Shirley. Richard has just spoken the name of the woman that he claims was killed in his presence. This was the woman who worked with sick families and children for years, was known to be a delight in the community, and took him in despite his crimes. And he remains emotionally unaffected. Even if he were to try and force an emotional response, or act one out horribly, that would be better than this. Again, his lack of reaction when standing trial for her murder is alarming. Do you have a brother? I do. And what's your brother's name? Robert Kenneth Merritt II. And 
And is there an age gap between the two of them? About nine years. Who's older and who's younger? Uh, my brother would be the older one. Now, growing up, what was the dynamics of the family? Was it just the four of them? It was just the four of us. Um, as I just mentioned, we moved around a lot. That was primarily when my brother had already gone up to college. Um, he was in college by the time I was third or fourth grade. So, um, but the dynamic when when he was still around or came to visit was, you know, we had a very traditional conservative Southern military household. My father was, as I said, career military. He went on to be a successful businessman. My mother sold real estate, was very good at it with her personality and natural intelligence. She was a, a star at it. And, um, you know, my brother and I, you know, we, we got along. Um, my father definitely ruled the roost. He was, he was the boss, but uh, my mother certainly um, had her say, too. It was definitely a partnership. Now, when did you guys move to 1590 Planners Road? My parents bought that house in the summer of 1993. That would have been the end of my freshman year at the University of Georgia. Now, is that where you went for undergrad? Yes, I went to UGA. And did you graduate UGA? I did. What did you, you major? I was a double major in English and political science, basically pre-law. And did you go to law school? I did. And where did you go to law school? I went to law school at Mississippi College School of Law in Jackson, Mississippi. Now, while you were in undergrad, did you meet a certain lady? I met a certain lady. Her name was uh, Janine Minicosi. I met Janine when she was a freshman and I was a junior. I'm about a year and a half, maybe a little bit more than a year and a half older than her. But we met through a, <clears throat> excuse me, we met through a mutual friend. And how long did you date before you got married? Well, early on, we... we dated off and on as, as kids do at Georgia, just enjoying the, the scene there in Athens. But as I proceeded into my senior year, it was, I guess, spring quarter of my senior year, getting ready to graduate, uh, we became more serious and decided we wanted to stay in a committed relationship. Now, by the time, what year did you get married? We got married in 1999, about a week after I graduated law school. And during that time, was she a veterinarian yet? No, she, I believe she started her first year of vet school, either my second or third year of law school, because she was still, had a couple years to go when I graduated law school. Now, by this time, when you got married, was your, was your father still around? Yes, he was. What year did he pass? 2000, about a year after we got married. So during this time, did your mom help you out? Yeah, they both did. Um, at the time, I, you know, I, I took me three attempts past the bar. I passed it the third time. I failed the first two times. I did thankfully have a job as a project manager with a local internet company, so I didn't have the pressure of needing the license, although it certainly would have been nice to, to get that under my belt right away. But, yeah, there were times when, when my parents helped us here and there while she was still in school, sure. After your father passed, what was the relationship between you and your mother? Well, after my dad died, it was, as you can imagine, just my brother and I and our immediate family. We are close to a lot of extended family, had a lot of close friends. But in terms of our family, it was obviously just my brother, mom, and I, and uh, we were close. So far, there's been no emotion of any kind in his testimony which does not align with his story. Imagine the person who helped you throughout the years, who took you in, even when your wife left you. Imagine that person was killed violently in front of you. Now try to recount even one memory where they are present. The amount of grief you would likely feel just talking about them would be immense. But not for Richard. He's direct and forthright with all of his information, only pausing to emphasize how even though it took him three chances to pass the bar, he didn't necessarily need to pass immediately because he already had a job. I'll be skipping the next three minutes of the testimony, as Richard talks about his children. But it should be noted that when talking about his son and daughter, he relays how good of a father he is through his own accomplishments instead of theirs. He also actively states that his son was the kind of kid any parent would want. 
and that he went to all of his activities, while he didn't do so with his daughter, who has cerebral palsy. And you mentioned your practice. What type of law did you practice? Well, in 2010, um, I opened up my own law firm. And before that, I had been at a large law firm in Buckhead. But I've always been a litigator, primarily civil litigation, mainly personal injury, uh, wrongful death, medical malpractice, some business litigation. When I opened up my own firm, I also did a little bit of criminal defense. I really didn't do felony work. I did a lot of DUIs, things of that nature. It should be noted that according to financial records, it was technically Shirley who opened Richard's law firm, as she paid for the lion's share of it. Now, during this time, around 2010, and as the practice grew, what type of lifestyle were you and Janine? When the firm opened in 2010? Well, we were a very sociable couple. We lived in a very uh, diverse neighborhood in Smyrna with a walking distance to downtown Smyrna where a lot of the restaurants and, and whatnot were at. The neighborhood was primarily people like us, two professionals, small kids. So there were a lot of children the same age as our children's ages. We got together for barbecues. We went to events together. We had each other over at each other's houses. There were a lot of sleepovers for the kids. Kids played baseball together uh, in the local Smyrna Little League. So there was always something going on, whether it was a neighborhood event or going to some sort of lawyer event or an an event associated with her veterinary practice. We We were out and about. Now, by this time, when the father's passing, did anyone else live at 1590 Planter Grove besides your mother? No. And up until her death, did anyone else live there besides you? No. No. Now, during this time, 2010, 2015, what was your relationship with your kids and your wife? Uh, in 2010? 2010 to 2015. How was the family dynamic? The only way to describe my family dynamic and my marriage was it was it was a dream. We were happy. We were fun loving. We laughed a lot. You know, Janine and I did a fair amount of traveling. Um, we were always doing things with the children. We didn't like to sit around and watch TV. We weren't that type of couple. We weren't sedentary by any means. Um, I was always trying to promote her career, and she was promoting mine. A lot of times we'd find out that we had clients in common and didn't even know it. And um, it was just a very idyllic way to live, to be married and to to raise kids, to be in a place that you enjoyed, around people you enjoyed, and to, to be building something, to be building a future. Now, during this time, around 2010, and as the practice grew, what type of lifestyle were you and Janine? When the firm opened in 2010? Mm-hmm. Well, we were a very sociable couple. We lived in a very uh, diverse neighborhood in Smyrna with a walking distance to downtown Smyrna where a lot of the restaurants and, and whatnot were at. The neighborhood was primarily people like us, two professionals, small kids. So there were a lot of children the same age as our children's ages. We got together for barbecues. We went to events together. We had each other over at each other's houses. There were a lot of sleepovers for the kids. Kids played baseball together uh, in the local Smyrna Little League. So there was always something going on, whether it was a neighborhood event or going to some sort of lawyer event or an an event associated with her veterinary practice. We We were out and about. Now, by this time, the father's passing... Did anyone else live at 1590 Planter Grove besides your mother? No. And up until her death, did anyone else live there besides you? No, no. Now, during this time, 2010, 2015, what was your relationship with your kids and your wife? Uh, in 2010? The only way to describe my family dynamic and my marriage was it was it was a dream. We were happy. We were fun-loving. We 
laughed a lot. You know, Janine and I did a fair amount of traveling. Um, we were always doing things with the children. We didn't like to sit around and watch TV. We weren't that type of couple. We weren't sedentary by any means. Um, I was always trying to promote her career, and she was promoting mine. A lot of times we'd find out that we had clients in common and didn't even know it. And um, it was just a very idyllic way to live, to be married and to, and to raise kids, to be in a place that you enjoyed, around people you enjoyed, and to, to be building something, to be building a future. His ex-wife would disagree with this statement, claiming that Richard was incredibly volatile, especially when he drank. On multiple occasions, she would barricade herself and the children in rooms away from Richard, believing that he would try to hurt them, but felt uncomfortable talking to law enforcement about it because he worked in law. Now, in 2018, what happened? In 2018, I was arrested in Cobb County for multiple counts of theft, forgery, and uh, there were some counts also of elder exportation because I did steal money from some elderly folks. Now, your arrest, was that a big deal in Cobb County? Yes, it was a big deal in Cobb County. Um, just a little bit of background. I was one of the few lawyers in Smyrna, and Smyrna has grown a lot since I started my practice in 2010, but it was right on the little village square across from the courthouse, uh, I was the only firm there. That was part of why I picked that area, because I saw a need. I wanted to be the local lawyer that people went to first for help. And it was a very successful vision. And um, so the practice grew. And when things went south quickly and I got arrested several years later in 2018, uh, it was a shock to our neighbors, the local community, and to, to the Cobb County Bar. Even when talking about his financial crimes, he cannot make himself seem repentant or remorseful. He was asked plainly if his arrest was shocking to the community, which is a simple yes. All he had to do was say, yes, I had a great reputation, and in an act of selfishness that I truly regret, I squandered that reputation and stole my client's money. But instead of doing anything close to that, he gives himself some kudos for picking the location of his practice that he stole people's money from, talks about how successful it was, and talks about how pristine his reputation was in the area because he was just that good. Now we got arrested. How many times did you get arrested? Actually, the first time I got arrested in connection with the Cobb County fraud was in April of 2017. It was shortly after spring break that year. We had just gotten back, and I had a letter from the Cobb County Magistrate Court telling me that I needed to appear at a warrant application hearing. And what that basically means is somebody has taken out a warrant for your arrest, and a judge has to determine if there's probable cause or not. So this hearing was on a Monday morning, and I went to the hearing, it happened to be two of the older ladies who were victims in the main arrest uh, in January of 2018. They had taken out a warrant for one th account of theft by conversion, alleging I'd stolen $70,000 of their settlement money. We had the hearing, and the judge found that there was probable cause. And the judge said, well, I'm going to set your bond at $2,000. And I will give you until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to appear at the Cobb County Jail. I left court. When I saw Janine that night, I told her as soon as I saw her after the kids were in bed, I said, I need to tell you something. She said, what? I said, I have a warrant for my arrest. And I explained to her what it was. I said, I don't know the extent of it. I know they're claiming I stole $70,000. need to figure out more about it. But in the meantime... I need to appear at the Cobb County Jail tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And so the next morning, she went with me early to James Bond Bonding Company, one of the bonding companies up there off of County Services Road. And we filled out the bond paperwork. She was the surety on the bond and paid the 200 some odd dollars down, which is the 10% of the 2000. And I turned myself into the Cobb County Jail shortly before 9 o'clock and was out by 2 o'clock that afternoon. He doesn't realize it, but his statement here fully corroborated his ex's story that he had denied. 
that being that he lied to her about his charges when the investigation started. As stated previously, he told his ex-wife that the charges were false and that they were being brought by two vindictive ex-clients. And here, he outright states that he told his wife about what the women were claiming, not that he had actually stolen their money and the money of 15 more of his clients. So the first time, she bonded you up. Correct. Um, Janine knew that I had been accused of a felony theft. She knew that I had booked in and out of the Cobb County Jail, and that was the last we ever discussed it until I was arrested along with everybody else, all the other victims, I should say, in uh, January of 2018. So the second time, did she provide any assistance to get you out of jail? No, she did not. Uh, to say she was less than pleased would be a, a vast understatement. Um, I was driving to deliver papers to somebody the morning of January 31st, 2018. Uh, several months earlier, I had voluntarily surrendered my bar license. Um, the bar had been investigating this. I knew what was coming, and it was just odd to me that I had never received an invitation from a detective to talk about it or anything like that. They just built their case, and then wham, there it was. So that's how they chose to proceed. But I was arrested on um, January 31st. I was, as I said, going to deliver some papers. A Cobb County Sheriff's Deputy SUV pulled up behind me, blue lighted me. I pulled over in a Taco Bell parking lot, and several unmarked uh, Crown Vicks appeared as well. I didn't learn until several hours later the scope and, and extent of what I was being charged with. I reached out to her. From the jail, I knew based on my experience as a lawyer that I would not be bonding out in the next few weeks. And sure enough, did not have a formal bond hearing before a Superior Court judge until about two weeks later. But Janine was very upset, didn't understand what was going on, which is certainly understandable. I frankly didn't know the extent of what was going on, although I had a pretty good idea. And... That's, that was her reaction at the beginning of that whole process. The fact that Richard is saying this on direct examination, not cross, is astounding, because once more, that makes him look horrible. It's clear, based on Richard's reaction to this question, that he is still incredibly mad at his ex-wife, despite the fact that her wanting to divorce him after finding out he stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from his elderly clients is more than rational. He states that she didn't have all the information and was simply confused and angry when she filed for divorce five days after he was arrested for the second time. He shakes his head, furrows his brow, and seems incredibly flippant about the whole ordeal, as if it's common sense that she would have stood by him. He is also upset that he hadn't been talked to by the people investigating him. He mentions that the cops simply put the case together and never contacted him for an interview, and implies that by not doing that, they did poor work. The police didn't need to talk to you about your financial crimes, Richard. They didn't need to go over your statements, because they had your court records and your financial records. Mind you, had the police actually spoken to Richard prior to his arrest, it's not as if he would have been honest with them. So that case, how many victims were there? There were 15 victims and 34 felony counts. And you mentioned... How long did you sit in jail waiting for the court? It's about two weeks, maybe a little less. And did you end up having a higher lawyer on that case? I did. And who's your lawyer? David Willingham. And were you able to pay him or did somebody else pay him? At that time, uh, funds were extremely tight and limited. Um, I was... In the Cobb County Jail, Janine was scrambling to try to make sense of what was going on and take care of the children. So my mother graciously offered to assist with his initial fee payment. And where was your mother's genuine demeanor and feelings at this time? My mother was upset. She was disappointed. She raised me better than that. And um, she had every right to be upset with me. It was a disgrace. And... Uh, there's no excuse for my behavior, but she was upset. But at the same time, um, I was her son. She truly did believe that one should hear out all sides of, of a situation before making an opinion. And she gave me the benefit of the doubt. 
and her goal was to help me get out and then I would get a very stern talking to once out. But her goal at the time was just to support me and try to help me get up the bond money. How much was your bond? The bond was $400,000. The down payment for the bond in order to actually get me out was 10%, so that would have been $40,000. How was that? Day? My mother, it took about two months, but what she ended up doing was taking out a home equity line of credit, basically a second mortgage on her home, in order to come up with the 40000 So ultimately, how much time lapsed between your getting a bond and getting out of jail? I believe it was about 65 or 66 days. And what were the conditions on the bond? Well, the bond conditions were as follows. I was to have a curfew of 5 p.m. to 8 a.m., which meant, obviously, I had to be back at her address. I had to live at her address, first of all. That was the first bond condition. Second condition was I had a curfew of, as I mentioned, 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. So I had to be back by 5 p.m. and I couldn't leave to leave the next morning until, I'm sorry, it was 8 a.m., 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. Obviously, I had to reside at her home in 1590 Planters Row in Stone Mountain, DeKalb County. I wasn't to drink any alcohol, do any drugs without a prescription, not to break any laws of the state of Georgia, pretty standard stuff. They also had me surrender my passport within the first 24 hours of release, which I did, and I was required to wear an ankle monitor. Now, once you were released, what was the relationship between you and your wife? It was very contentious. Um, she felt that I had led a double life. She didn't understand why I took money from these people. Um, she was upset. She was shocked. We went from having an idyllic life to having nothing. Um, oh, despite my urges to try, it was decided that she didn't want to stay in the home, so we let the house go. It was a very nice house that we loved and had lived in and raised our children in and planned to stay in a long time. So the house was gone. Um, she decided to move into a rental home in... East Cobb and Marietta, where the public schools are, are are quite good, and my son had attended the Lovett School, which is a private school, but he wasn't going to be able to go there anymore. My daughter went to public school because of her disability, so thankfully she could attend school wherever she wanted, um, based on having a disability. But it was a, it was a major upheaval. I mean, it, overnight it was as if a bomb went off in our lives. And at some point in time, did she file for divorce? Uh, very quickly. She filed for divorce four days into my arrest. And did that divorce ultimately was it completed? Yes, the divorce was finalized, I believe, third week of June 2018. And I, I didn't fight her on the divorce. I understood her emotions. I understood the reasons uh, for it. Um, I certainly didn't want her to be accused of having any part of my misdeeds because I, I truly did act alone. Uh, she wasn't involved. I think early on some folks may not have believed that, but it turned out that the divorce not only was what she wanted emotionally, but uh, perhaps helped out in segregating you know, my behavior from you know, obviously her not having an involvement. I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the reasons that Janine felt as if Richard had lived a double life and couldn't be trusted around the children was the fact that shortly before his second arrest, he had pawned the family's specialized van, used specifically for their daughter's disabilities. So, I mean, I don't know, Richard, maybe that's why she felt she needed to get away from you so quickly. Now, after your release, what was your relationship with your kids? My son was 14, 14 and a half at the time, and as I said, we were very close, and he had me up on a a pedestal like a lot of boys do their father and he was upset with me he yelled at me he ignored me he cried he he was hurting there's no relevance to his kids feelings we've heard from dr minicosi and she went into detail about the things that the son felt, things that the son did, and things the son told her during this time period. 
but that doesn't make it relevant. So how is this relevant? So I'm a mom. What's your mother? By this time you've been with your mother. Yes. And you're out of jail. Correct. What was your relationship with her? She was she wasn't pleased with my behavior. Um, she was embarrassed. But at the same time, she was willing to give me a chance, give me a place to live, help me help me survive. I mean, I, I really didn't have much other than my personal effects and an old pickup truck, literally. So she opened up her home to me, and it was strange being back under her roof at, I guess I was 43, 44 years old when all this went down. Um, but, you know, it, 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 after the first several days and weeks, you know, we got into a routine and it, it was fairly normal under the circumstances. Again, this is a great moment to show emotion. He's been given the chance to go into detail about how his mom helped him in a moment of need, how she stuck her neck out on the line for him by taking out a line of credit to bail him out and letting him stay under her roof. He should feel remorseful or at the very least embarrassed that she had to do this because of his crimes. But he is direct and matter of fact, as if what she did wasn't a big deal. Your mother, are you fighting? My mother's a very strong little person. I believe the term firecracker was used, and that is a very good term. I would throw another one out there. She's a steel magnolia. My mother is a strong southern woman, and she had no problem telling me what I thought, uh, what she thought rather down to what I wore, to my opinions on certain things. But it was certainly not toxic. We were both opinionated people. We spoke our minds. Um, but we also laughed a lot and spent a lot of time together. So I, it, there's nothing abnormal to me or her about it. Now, as your criminal case made its way through the process, um, did you start to feel some of the external pressures? You mean as we got closer to uh, sentencing. sentencing? Yes, it was, it was a very odd time starting in... I would say right around the 1st of January 2019, my sentencing hearing had been set way back in September of 2018. Uh, I actually wanted a plea earlier and get on with it and get on down the road to prison, but the DA at the time in Cobb County wasn't ready yet. He wanted to make sure there weren't any more victims, which was fine. It certainly is prerogative. So there weren't any more victims, and then the plea date was set for September, I'm sorry, in September the plea date was set for January 18th of 2019, a Friday. And about, right about the 1st of January 2019, my mother's house kind of sits up on a cul-de-sac. And you can see the whole cul-de-sac. And I saw an abnormal amount of cars pulling slowly through, stopping in front of our home. Uh, my mother noticed the same thing. I began receiving hang-ups on my cell phone, numbers I didn't recognize. Some said unknown number, but area codes and numbers I didn't know. My mother was receiving the same thing. She showed me her phone, just wanting to know if I knew who these numbers were, and, and I didn't. And this seemed to go on with some frequency uh, up until... January 14th of 2019. Now, during this time, were you speaking with your wife? Yes, of course. And likewise, does she have concerns? I believe, you know, if I recall correctly, she did. Um, the, the victims in this case have been characterized, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, I'm just trying to answer truthfully and honestly. The victims have been characterized As Objection, Your Honor. What the victims have been characterized as is not relevant. I don't know if that's hearsay or where he's coming up with this, but I don't believe that that's relevant. And they're, they're not victims in this case. There's no, no. one victim in this case. Correct. So how is this testimony relevant? All right. 
I'll sustain the objection. So, while we don't know exactly what Richard was going to say, it was clear that he was trying to set up a narrative that the men and women he stole nearly half a million dollars from were stalking him and his family. He was trying to insinuate that the elderly clients he had taken on were going out of their way to harass him, as well as his mother and his ex-wife, although his ex-wife denies this happening. This is clearly done to give an alternative version of events, where it would make sense that his mom would be attacked and killed. Of course, that does not make any sense, because let's say that his victims are stalking him and his family, let's say they weren't satisfied that he had been sentenced to 15 years in prison and felt like he was getting off easy, why wouldn't they attack him? According to his own story, they had guns. They could have shot him in the legs, stabbed him and beaten him with the weight, but they didn't. Instead, according to him, they brutalized his mother, then allowed him to go and start a new life without so much as laying a hand on him, which doesn't make any sense. Had his victims been willing to kill anyone in their case, they would have obviously killed him, but they didn't do that, mostly because they were elderly men and women who wouldn't be able to. Now, we're here with you. Well, it was your father. Yes. And did you ever feel that Maybe somebody will have to get you. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Now let's talk about, at some point in time, as we can see, that's in one, a cartoon rock. Yes. And where, what day was that? That was January 14th, 2019. And who received that cartoon? That cartoon was received at my mother's home at Planters Row in DeKalb County. It was personally delivered in her mailbox and discovered by her. Did you have discussions with her about it? Right away. I was, I believe, on my way to work. I was working at a warehouse at the time, and I received a call from her informing me of receipt of this cartoon, and she was upset. And literally, as I hung up with her, I received a call from my ex-wife, Janine, who you've heard from. And she was upset. And what was concerning to me, because it was directed at me as well, not only in the substance of the cartoon, but obviously had to deal with something I was involved in in Cobb County. What concerned me was that these are copies of the same cartoon being delivered 40 miles apart, two different counties, with a county or two in between these counties. And it was a concerted effort, whoever delivered them. Again, this is going towards the narrative that Richard's family is being unduly harassed due to his crimes. In this story, apparently a cartoon and a rock, or a cartoon rock, I'm not sure, was left in his mother's and ex-wife's mailbox. I wasn't able to find the contents of the cartoon, but we can assume it was threatening and scared both women enough that they called Richard. Richard suspects that this was a concerted effort, as his ex-wife and his mother live 40 miles away from each other. But that being said, it's completely possible for this to have been done by one person, and have that person doing it for reasons besides what Richard is alleging. Some records indicate that the police believed that Richard himself had left the cartoon in the mailboxes, as a way to argue to the court that he and his family were being unfairly penalized. Obviously, it's suspicious that the day before Richard is sentenced, both his mother and his ex found harassing images in their mailbox. But if that led to Richard having two people in his family speak to the court on his behalf, the judge would likely be more than open to considering probation. But even if the person who did this wasn't Richard, a person putting a cartoon in a mailbox is not the same as a person killing someone. Is it a kind thing to do? No. But the way Richard is trying to shape this action as being a precursor for what happened to his mother is ridiculous. Now, within a day or so, what happened to your mother? Well, actually, it started the night that she received the cartoon. Um, I got back, and she was upset. Um, she started feeling dizzy, having difficulty breathing, having chest pain. Uh, and it's, she, she just was very concerned about the cartoon, about the effect on Janine and the kids. And I should add that Janine felt as if um, 
well, she didn't feel. She was quite adamant that she was keeping my son Jack home from school the next day and she wasn't going to go to work. And she had called somebody at the Cobb County DA's office or sheriff's office, and I'm not sure which, to inform them of it. And my mother was concerned that they weren't going to do anything. And, in fact, they didn't. Um, so there, there was definitely concern on, on both sides. My mother had these symptoms. She decided that she needed to go to the ER. Well, I had the ankle monitor on, and the curfew had been moved back to midnight because I had started a job at Petco Warehouse up in Gwinnett County. And in order to, to make my hours, I had to be able to get the curfew moved back, which my pretrial officer, basically my probation officer, was happy to do because they want you to have a job. So long story short, I wasn't still going to be able to drive her because my mother really didn't make the decision to, to go to the hospital until probably 10, 30, 11 that night. There's no way I could take her there, drop her off, and get back and not be in violation of my monitor. So she was able to drive herself. They admitted her, and I think she was admitted at early morning hours of the 15th, and she was discharged sometimes on the 16th. Now, after she was discharged, did your mom still have concerns? It was all we talked about. Um, she got back home that Wednesday when I first encountered her. I remember distinctly sitting at the kitchen table. We were, we were a kitchen table family, so discussions were had at the kitchen table or around the, the kitchen counter, around the island where the sink was. So we talked about it. And back a few days earlier on Monday, I had taken a picture of the cartoon on my phone and sent it to my lawyer, David Willingham, so he was aware. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he received a copy as well as something else. And and Mr. Queen, this has turned into a lot of narrative. So you need to either ask some specific questions or instruct your client to confine his answers to the questions that are asked. So I'll sustain the objection. Yes, so what did your mother do in response to the cartoon as it relates to the attorney's one? She began to draft a letter to Mr. Willingham. And to your knowledge, was that letter delivered? To my knowledge, it was. On what day was this? What day? What, is January 15, 16, 17? What day are we? I remember her showing me a draft of the letter quite soon after she got home because my mother this type of person to handle stuff while I was fresh on her mind. So she showed me a draft of it. I said, do whatever you want, send it. And I, I have no reason to think that's not what happened, and, and, and it did in fact happen. Now, what day was your sentencing here? Friday the 18th. And how did that go? It was a quite an event. Um, Court that day was to start at 9 a.m. and it lasted all day. Did you have a plea on that day? I did. Did the victim get an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the sentence on that? They certainly did. And the way it worked that day is I showed up and entered my plea, but there had not been an agreement on the precise sentencing. I rejected the state's initial offer. The judge assured us that he would not go more serious than that offer. So the hope was maybe I would end up getting a little less time than what the state's initially recommended. The judge heard testimony from the victims all day. I believe I was the final person to testify. And then the judge pronounced his sentence 435 in the afternoon. Based on his phrasing and tone, it's clear to see that Richard is annoyed at the fact that his own victims were allowed to give victim impact statements at his sentencing. He also seems to believe that having to speak last at his trial is somehow unjust, despite stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you said you testified. Was it a trial? 
No, it was not a trial. I, I pled guilty in the first few minutes of the proceeding. The rest of the day was simply about the judge hearing from victims, hearing from me, and making a decision on what he wanted the sentence to be. There was no question about my guilt at any point. And what was the sentence? The sentence was 30 to 15. Plus, I had to pay back $526,000 in restitution. Now, in, did you go to jail that day? No, I did not. When were you report to the jail? The judge was gracious enough to give me two weeks to report, which would be February 1st by 5 p.m. at the Cobb County Jail. And he made it abundantly clear what would happen if I did not show up. What would happen if you didn't show up? If I did not show up, he would revoke my sentence, and it would be a serve 30 sentence, which could affect it could affect parole and all sorts of other things. So the sentence would be much harsher if I did not appear as scheduled and ordered. So after sentencing, what did you do during this period of time between sentencing and the day before the show up? Well, um, that day... Um, just starting off with what, how it was handled. I mean, I, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't upset. I accepted my punishment, and my mother and I got in the car and we left. Now turn your attention to uh, Mr. Jeffco. What's your relationship, with Mr. Jeffco? Mike is technically um, some degree of a cousin, but. We come from a large family where, you know, we don't really get in all that. And I knew Mike my whole life, and we were close. And was there understanding for Mike to take you, originally take you to jail? Yes. Um, I believe Tuesday or Wednesday that week, my mother and I decided that it would probably be best at, at that time when we had the discussion that Mike um, come and Take my mother to, I mean, I'm sorry, take me to the Cobb County Jail. Now, is it that your mother didn't know how to get there? No, my mother had been to the Cobb County Jail plenty to visit me and to go arrange the bond. So, what caused things to change with that plan? Mr. Jeff Cotillo. Right. Uh, Thursday night, after I got back from seeing the children, uh, my mother and I were talking, and we just felt like, it was a private family matter, an intimate family matter. Even though Michael's family, it was something that she and I wanted to share and handle. That was really all there was to it. We didn't want to inconvenience him. So did you ask your mother to call Michael? We both decided that it wasn't necessary for him to be there. Why is that? Because we didn't want to inconvenience Mike, because um, we actually had a few things we wanted to talk about. And we, we just frankly didn't need anybody else's help. So here, Richard's lawyer is trying to give an alternate reason for events. Originally, Richard was going to be driven to the prison by his cousin, and this had been set up weeks in advance. This was allegedly done because Shirley didn't want to witness her son walking into prison and felt that that would be too hard on her. However, directly before the murder, and completely coincidentally, Richard and Shirley would reverse their decision and tell Mike that he no longer had to come over to pick Richard up. Now, this could have been completely innocent. Maybe Shirley wanted to see her son off, and she did feel like it was her responsibility. But it's also incredibly convenient, as Richard had been the one to kill his own mother. It would mean that no one would discover her body for days, and he would get a head start on the police. So the morning of the first, what time did you get back to the house? Oh... Around 8.30, I think, somewhere in there, 8.30, 8.45. And tell us what happened that day. So when I left the doctor's appointment and was driving back, I, it was the last time that I saw Mia uh, before I knew I had to turn myself in later in the day. Mia was my baby girl. She's my princess. So naturally, I was sad. Um, it was a sad ride home, just like the night before after saying goodbye to Jack. When I walked into the way that she got back into my mother's house is that I would park my car in the driveway. Her car was in the garage. If the garage door wasn't open, I'd open it and walk through the garage door into the kitchen. So I walked into the kitchen. I'm sorry? I was the garage The garage door opener. 
you have a separate garage door or was it on a panel on the door? No, no, it was in it was in my car. Yeah. So what showed the garage door? I, I went inside and it had been obvious that I I was upset. I had tears in my eyes and she just came over and hugged me. She knew why and I was sad about saying goodbye to my children. Richard discussing how upset he was is almost comical, as he is talking about his last interaction with his children, and he has no emotion. And he's been talking about his mother being brutally murdered in front of him, and again, he has no emotion. He's shown absolutely no emotion besides annoyance this entire time. Well, shortly thereafter, um, we both, she sent Mike the text saying that things aren't so good here, and that's exactly what it was about. We were, it was just... Just not a happy day. I mean, I was about to go away to prison for possibly 15 years. So it was a private time. I, there was no yelling or screaming. I just, and, and I sent him a similar text, and that was that. So after those texts were sent, I started to go through some of my stuff and sort through some of my personal effects and. My mother and I, oddly enough, I had been so busy spending time with the kids and, and doing other things. She and I hadn't had a discussion about how to organize my clothes or, or what maybe to sell or, or any of that kind of basic housekeeping type of stuff. It, and those were things we needed to talk about. That's what we mentioned in the text when we said we need to discuss things. That's it. Now, is there a plan for you all to have lunch together? Yes, my mother um, was a great cook, fantastic cook, and she was going to make spaghetti. So did she start preparations for lunch? Yes, she did. And then what happened? It was, you know, the plan was we were going to eat around 1 o'clock so that we could be on the road by 2, no later than 2.30. It was, I believe, Super Bowl weekend, Friday afternoon traffic, a bunch of stuff going on in Atlanta. And, you know, obviously we don't want to be late to the jail, given the importance of me being on time. I was walking from the kitchen. I had just left the kitchen from keeping her company while she was making the spaghetti when I heard a very loud knock at the front door. We weren't expecting any visitors. So I went to the front door, and I opened it. And there were two individuals there, two men, and they both were pointing pistols at me. And they told me to let them in. So what did you do? I let them in. This would be traumatic. Recounting an event as terrifying as the one he has just begun to recount would be daunting. But again, he still has no emotion. His tone is almost comical, as if this is funny to him. When you testify in a jury trial, you want to get them on your side. You want them to see you in this hyper-specific way and make your version of events so real that they can't help but agree with you. But everything that Richard has done is completely contrary to what he is saying. He doesn't seem to care about anything that he's talking about, even though his life hangs in the balance, as if he believes that he can win them over just by being there and explaining this nonsensical story to them. I had never seen these guys before, and they're pointing pistols at me, so I let them in. I let them in. They shut the door. Uh, About this time, my mother came to the foyer where I was standing with these two individuals, and they said, head to the basement and don't say an effing word. So did you go to the basement? The taller of the individuals, he was older, probably in his 50s, about six feet, athletically built, walked past me, put the gun at my mother's lower back, and she started to head towards the stairway to the basement. The fact they said head to the basement led me to think they knew we had a basement and had cased the house before. The younger of the men, he's probably about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, shoulder-length brown hair, pudgy, he put his gun on my back and we followed them. She opened the stair door to the basement, Flicked on the light. It was a two, two-step two process to get down those stairs. You had four or five steps that went down. There's a landing, and then you make the turn, and there's the longer flight of stairs. They proceeded first. My mother was crying. She was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. And as 
they made the turn on the landing and took those first few steps. By this point, I and the guy behind me who had the gun on my back made it to the landing. He told her to shut the F up and pushed her down the stairs. And look at his face after saying that. This is not the face of someone who is recounting a traumatic event. This is not the face of someone who is telling the truth. This is the face of someone who believes that they are getting one over on everybody because they're just so clever. It was the worst sound I've ever heard in my life. Um, She plunged headlong into the wall. It's a sound I can hear to this day as I'm sitting here. And I could tell that there was a dent or a hole in the wall. She was trying to get up and move around, but from my vantage point, she appeared like she couldn't get her balance. And she certainly appeared to be. And as I moved like I was going to try to go down the stairs, the guy dug the pistol into my back and grabbed my shoulder. The gentleman who pushed her down the stairs put his pistol behind his back into the, the back part of his jeans. He ran down the stairs, turned the corner, and came back with the 35 pounds weight that is been seen during the course of this trial. Where did the knife come from? Well, (laughs) the knife came later. Um, He just laughed. He laughed while recounting how his mother was viciously killed, but he seems entirely unaware that he's doing a bad job. Richard is very, very confident in all of his bullshit. This monster took this dumbbell and proceeded to bludgeon my mother right in front of me. And she was... She stopped moving at this point. He then told the man who had his pistol in my back to bring me down to the bottom of the stairs. They shoved me over to the tile where the dumbbell rested. And then the older guy took off up the stairs. He came back a few minutes later with the kitchen knife and proceeded to stab my mother repeatedly in front of me. I I cannot believe what I was seeing. I didn't understand what would be the purpose because she wasn't moving? Why is any of this happening? It was a complete and utter nightmare. So what did you do during this time? There's nothing I could do. I had a, a pistol to my back. I couldn't believe this was happening. I had no clue who these people were or why they were doing this to us. So he stabbed her with such force that the handle broke off the knife. I didn't realize at the time that the knife was still stuck in my poor mother's face. He put the handle down on the tile across from the dumbbell. He then turned and looked at me, and he pulled out his cell phone. And he proceeded to show me a picture of my ex-wife dropping Mia off at her school, a picture of Jack being dropped off or picked up at Lovett. A picture of them all getting out of her van at their rental home in Marietta. And a picture of her either coming or going from her clinic in Bynings. And he said, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, if you say a single word, they're next. I had no doubt who they were or what next meant. And then they left. Let's go over this stupid story. So in the weeks leading up to his sentencing for stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars, Richard and his family start receiving anonymous harassment from his victims. The harassment gets so bad that direct threats in the form of a cartoon are left at his mother's and ex-wife's mailboxes. However, the very next day, he's sentenced to 15 years in prison and to pay restitution to his victims. Then, two weeks later, the very day he is supposed to report to prison and begin serving his sentence, the two men who are not his victims come to his house, brutally murder his mother in front of him, seemingly because of his crimes, and then tell him if he doesn't keep his mouth shut, they will kill his entire family. Which is ridiculous. If someone wanted to enact revenge on Richard, why would they go through the effort of not killing him? 
He had seen their faces, they had their guns drawn on him, and they had come there with the express purpose of killing him, but when push came to shove, they decided to kill his mother, threaten him a little bit, then leave him there completely unharmed. That doesn't make any sense, but we've seen defenses like this before, most notably in the case of Diane Downs. And then, did you call the police? No, I did not call the police. Because I just witnessed an unimaginable act of violence. Two unimaginable acts of violence. And then a man coldly looked at me after he's standing over the body of my dear mother that he skewered and bludgeoned and shows me pictures of my family. So no, I did not call the police. How much longer did you say that? I stood there numb and incapable of moving for what seemed like minutes. These guys had left. I went upstairs. All I could think about was Janine and the kids and what these monsters could do. And... I went and got a small backpack out of my room. I put a few few clothes. I didn't pack much. Some basic toiletries. And I left. He was smiling during the first half of that statement. I don't want to definitively state that that was a duping delight smile, but he is extremely pleased with himself. The majority of the testimony has been laying the groundwork for his defense, and he seems to believe now he is bringing everything home and really convincing everyone of his stupid ass story. Now, why did you take your mother's car? I took my mother's car because it had more gas in it than my car. It had a bigger tank. And I had no idea where I was going or where I was going to end up. And it seemed to me in that state of mind that at least her car would be easier to sleep in. And that's why I took her car. This statement alone is damning. He didn't state that he was in a mental crisis. He didn't claim to be going through a psychological break as a result of seeing his mother being brutally killed. Instead, he says he chose to take her car because it had more gas in the tank, as well as better gas mileage and it was easier to sleep in. His thinking was incredibly logical, and the fact that it was after witnessing his mother's death would make him look even worse in the eyes of the jury. So where'd you go? When I left her house, um, I went out of the neighborhood. I don't even know what time of day it was when I left, but I went out of the neighborhood. I made a right and went up, I believe it was called Rock Bridge, but it becomes Five Forks Strip and we're right at the DeKalb County, Gwinnett County line. And I made a left, I'm not sure if it was Arcata or Killian Hill, but up by the Kroger there and just started heading towards 85. Now, how much time did it take you to get to Nashville? Is that where you go? Did you go straight to Nashville? No, no, I didn't go all the way to Nashville in one one shot. Um, no, I I ended up going to the QT station at Indian Trail in '85. I stopped to get a couple of bottles of water, some snacks. Um, I only had eighteen dollars cash on me. Um, I topped off the tank, I believe, put some gas in it, and then I proceeded towards towards Cobb County, towards 285, and then ultimately to 75. Why did you cut your monitor off? Well, the reason I cut my monitor off is I was concerned by the time I got north of Cobb County, you know, I was within, I believe, an hour or so of when I was supposed to report. I had no idea if just by routine the monitoring people were watching me or not. So that's why I headed towards Cobb County. I didn't want to do anything that would get me involved with the police because I didn't want it to come back to hurt my family if these guys found out and thought I had said something. 
Now, why do you take both phones? For that very reason. I had every reason to believe, based on this horrific event, that these individuals had a lot of hate for me, had been following me and or my ex-wife and kids, and perhaps they had our numbers, perhaps they were the ones who had been calling and hanging up. I, I didn't know. I, I wanted to have the phones in case they had demands. If they went back to the house, I had to know what was going on. And if Janine called either myself or my mother, I wanted to know what was going on with her, that she was okay, that the kids were okay. So that's why I took both phones. He's now directly claiming his mother's murder had to do with his crime, but that doesn't make sense. Again, if most people wanted to take revenge on a person, they wouldn't attack someone tangentially related to the person. They would simply attack the person they want revenge on. Moreover, most murderers would not go through the effort to kill a stranger as violently as Shirley was murdered. According to Richard's own story, they had guns. They had the means to kill her without hurting themselves, or exerting that much energy. And yet, for seemingly no other reason than they wanted to get their steps in, they repeatedly walked up and down the basement stairs in order to retrieve new weapons to use on her, and left Richard completely unharmed. Which again, makes no sense. So how long did it take you to get to Nashville? Ultimately, I probably got to Nashville. I mean, I, I think they're an hour behind, but I, I ended up in Nashville after dark. Of course, it was wintertime, so it gets dark early everywhere. But I, it was probably 7, 8 o'clock Central Time by the time I actually got there. And why did you stay in Nashville? Nashville is a big city. I had no more money to buy gas, and it seemed like a safe place to pull off and park and try to figure out what in the world was going on. And eventually, did you get a job in Nashville? Yes, I got a job at a at a bar uh, called Betty's Bar and Grill on the west side of Nashville. And you heard yesterday, well, last week from. Um, Kelly Richardson. And how'd you meet Kelly? I met Kelly online. And did you start living with Kelly? Fairly quickly, yes. Were two in a relationship? Yes. Did she know who you were? No, she did not. And why didn't you tell her? I did not tell her because, again, in my mind, with how horrific the events of my mother's murder were, how graphic the people were capable of such insane violence, I had to believe that they would keep their word and take it out on my ex-wife and my children if anything was said. So I adopted a new identity and I made a vow to myself that I would never reveal who I was. And there were many, many times I wanted to to Kelly but I wanted to tell her that I was accused of a murder I did not commit, but I didn't because I didn't want to endanger her and I didn't want to endanger Janine and the kids. Now, Kelly, did you and Kelly ever have any problems? Anybody bothered you to her? No, no, absolutely not. She was telling us that around about the date when she got arrested, that she wanted you to move out or stay somewhere else? What was going on? Kelly, at the time, was a PhD student in chemistry, and she had a lot of work to do, and she needed her space. It wasn't relationship space. It was, hey, just go find somewhere else to be for a day or two so I can get my project done. That's all it was. Now, during, by that time, what happened to the car? I want to say it was the Wednesday or Thursday before I got arrested. I got arrested Monday, September 30th, 2019 in Nashville by the Marshals. I want to say Thursday the 26th, I woke up. I believe Kelly was already in class or at her lab, and the car was gone. Kelly lived in an attic apartment in an old house on 18th Avenue. Um, near the university, and 
I didn't know it, but apparently there were a lot of break-ins and um, learned after the fact that the car had been broken into and during investigation of it by the Vanderbilt police, the car got towed. And that's what ultimately led to my capture. So I woke up, walked out, the car was gone. So did you have anywhere to stay with the car being gone? Not right off the bat, no. Tell us how you ended up getting arrested. Yeah, on that Monday, I was, um, the weather was starting to change in Nashville. It was getting cool at night. Um, I was walking in West Nashville in an area called Sylvan Park where Betty's was and a few other places that I knew. And there was the old Southern thrift shop, which I had bought good cheap clothes before. And I was just looking for a light jacket because I didn't have one. And as I was done browsing through the store, I didn't see one. I started to walk out. And next thing I knew, I was surrounded by five or six marshals. And my face was in the floor looking up at them. And they told me I was under arrest. So, Richard, getting back to February 1st. Yes. Did you kill your mother? Absolutely not. I loved my mother. She stood by me. I'm not a violent person. I've laid a finger on anybody. Imagine you're in Richard's position. You killed your mother, but you think you can get away with a murder if you convince the people around you that it wasn't really you. It was actually these two identified people that there's no direct evidence of. You work on your story so it fits all the evidence that was found at the scene, and you meticulously plan for your day in court. Besides, you're a lawyer. You know this. You can get away with this. And then, when you get in court, you try and assert your innocence. This is the best you can do. Richard has shown zero emotion when talking about his mother. When going over the horrific details of her death, he smiled and seemed pleased with himself. I personally gave a lot of shit to Nancy Brophy and Tony Todd when they took the stand in their own defense, but at the very least, they both pretended to cry. Personally, I think it's kind of funny how his narrative presents the fact that his mother's murder had the unintended consequence that he just had to skip town and not go to prison. It's almost as if he's saying, hey guys, I really wanted to go serve 15 years in prison, but I can't, which is a total bummer. That was it in terms of his direct examination. Richard had accomplished literally nothing he had set out to do, but he seems pretty satisfied with himself. So that's really all that matters. So now let's watch the cross-examination. Mr. Merritt, what you said happened in front of your eyes on February 1st, 2019 must have been horrifying for you. It was. You said that it shook you up. Absolutely. You were afraid for your own life? I was so traumatized by what happened to my mother, I really wasn't worried about myself at that point. Okay, but you were concerned for your wife? And your daughter and your son? Yes. And you were so scared that you got out of there as fast as you could. Right? Yes, I did. Okay. Made the decision not to turn yourself into the Cobb County Jail, right? Correct. And um, instead, you cut your ankle monitor off. Yes. But before you even did that, you made some stops along the way. You stopped at a Kroger on... You, you stopped at a Kroger per, first, correct? No, I didn't actually stop there. Okay, but you stopped in the parking lot and you drove around the parking lot in the Kroger, right? Correct, I did. Okay, because you didn't need gas at that point because your mom's car was full enough to get you out of there. That's what you testified to, correct? To get me most of the way there, yes. Okay, and then you stopped at a QT in Norcross, and we saw the video of that. Do you recall? I did. Okay, and you were there for how long? Do you remember? Honestly, don't remember. Okay. Did you feel that you were being chased at that point? At that point, no, I did not. Okay. Did you feel like your life was in danger at that point? I didn't know, honestly. Okay. okay. So you bought waters and a candy bar? Yes. Okay. And then you drove around 285 West, and you took the 75 North exit, right? Correct. Now, tell me if I'm wrong, but your wife's uh, practice is over in Vinings, uh, kind of a, a, on West Paces Ferry and Paces Mill. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And so you passed that exit when you got on to 75 North. Correct. And you did not stop to tell your wife that you had just watched your mother being killed and her life was in danger. Correct? No, I did not. 
Okay. And your son's school, Love It, is just down the street from that. It's on West Paces Ferry. Is that right? Yes. And you did not make any efforts to take that exit, which is the exit before the exit to your wife's veterinarian clinic, um, to pick up your son from school or alert anyone that his life was in danger. My son, I believe, was with his grandfather that day. He wasn't at school. Okay, but you never made any phone calls to your wife? Correct? No, I did not. You never called Jack's school, right? No, I did not. You never called Mia's school, right? No, I did not. And so Jack was with Sal. That's your uh, previous father-in-law. Did you ever call Sal McCosey to let him know that you had seen this horrible event and that he and your entire family were in danger? I didn't call any of them because the killers told me don't say a word to anyone. So I took them at their word based on what they did. Okay, but they weren't following you, right? I don't know if they were following me or not. Okay. All right. So they could have very well been behind you. It's entirely possible. I have no idea what vehicle they were in. Okay, and a safe place to go would have been the Cobb County Jail, which you drove right past on 75 North. Is that correct? The instructions were, and I took them at their word based on what they did to my mother, don't say a word to anyone. The last place to go would be to somewhere like the Cobb County Jail. Well, apparently Richard thinks this is still hilarious. The prosecution is pointing out all the narrative flaws in Richard's thinking. How if he believed everyone in his life was in danger, he would have stopped along the way and called someone to give them a warning. She points out all the times he could have, all the stops he made along the way, but he never did. And when responding, Richard begins to smile, as if this back and forth is funny, as if what she is saying is so comical because it's outlandish, despite the fact that everything he said for the past hour is clearly false. And why is that? Well, you have law enforcement there. If they have people in Cobb County, they know a report. I'm more likely to say something because I'm in the safety of the jail. That made no sense to me whatsoever. Okay, so you didn't make any calls to anybody to warn them that their lives were in danger, right? These gentlemen told me, and I use gentlemen very sarcastically, these monsters told me, don't say a word to anyone. After what they did to my mother, I didn't say a word to anyone, without qualification. Okay, so these monsters, do you think that they were the same people who had been chasing your house starting at the beginning of January? Well, they sure knew we had a basement right off the road. Okay, and how many times had people driven off around the cul-de-sac, or driven around the cul-de-sac, as you testified earlier? Suspiciously, at least 20 or 30 times by my count. 20 or 30 times? Did you ever get any of their tag numbers? It would have been possible to run out there in the dark and get their tag numbers. Did you ever call the police to say, oh my gosh, somebody is following me? Did you Actually, ever do that? my mother and I did discuss it. You discussed it, but you never called the police, and you never made a report of people casing your house or running around the, the cul-de-sac in their cars, right? No, we didn't. Did you ever talk to any of the neighbors about what was going on? Uh, I didn't. I can't say if my mother did or not. Okay. Um, so... You weren't concerned at this point about these people riding around in the cul-de-sac because you obviously didn't make any, do anything to, to prevent it from happening. In the Quite future. the opposite, ma'am. I told my lawyer immediately when it happened who did absolutely nothing. Okay. All right. We got Nick Cage over here with the decimating responses, but there's a huge issue with what he's saying. He stated that his mother's home was being obviously cased, so much so that his elderly mother noticed as much. However, no one else in the neighborhood noticed any unusual cars in the neighborhood. No one else saw any suspicious activity. And the only person, besides the decedent, that knows about this alleged harassment is Richard's former lawyer, who did not report and cannot testify. It's basically the perfect excuse. It's like in middle school, when you lie and say you have a girlfriend who goes to another school. But no one else knows her. They don't have social media. But they totally are a model and they exist. But Richard's entirely delusional about how poorly his story is coming across. He is absurdly confident, cocking his eyebrow up and trying to be snarky to the prosecution, as if what she's saying is ridiculous. All right. And you knew he did absolutely nothing. Uh, he told me he was actually going to reach out to his contacts at the DA's office, where he used to work alongside the person who prosecuted me, as well as his contacts with law enforcement and Cobb. They all did absolutely nothing. Okay. Um, but did you ever call DeKalb County Police? Because that's where your mother's house was located. 
No, I didn't call, and neither did my mother, to my knowledge. Okay, and you understand that DeKalb County Police would have jurisdiction over your mother's house? Of course they would, ma'am, but the root of the activity was all indications sourced out of Cobb County. All right. Um, so these two, you called them monsters, right? Yes. You've never seen these guys in your life? Never. And they were both kind of big. You said one was pudgy. What about the other one? He was athletic and thin. Okay. And could you describe what they were wearing? Yes, I can. What was that? The athletic thin one was wearing sort of a black thermal long sleeve top and what looked like dicky khaki pants. Okay. And what kind of gun was he holding? Could you see? I'm not a gun guy, but it was a semi-automatic, sort of like the police have. It was All right. not a revolver. What color was it? It was black. All right. And what about the other guy? What, what did he look like? You said he was pudgy, but how else did he look? Uh, he was pudgy, had shoulder-length brown hair, brown eyes, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and he was wearing a camouflage hoodie. Okay. Well, um, did he have the hoodie up? No. Okay. So you got a knock on the door after being followed or having people suspiciously drive around your neighborhood for several weeks, right? Yes. And this was the day that you were supposed to turn yourself into the jail. Yes, it was. And you looked out the window, right? I did. And you saw that there was a guy all in black, right? I didn't say he was all in black. A black shirt and dicky pants. He was wearing a black top. That was it. And a guy wearing a camouflage hoodie, right? And blue jeans. And you had never seen these guys before, but you decided to answer the door. I opened the door. I had, we don't, we did not have a peephole in the door. It was not uncommon to just open the door. Could have been a neighbor. Could have been anybody. I certainly didn't expect that in the middle of the day. Okay. And um, they held you up at gunpoint? Yes. They said, let us in now. They didn't shoot you. No, they didn't shoot me. They didn't shoot your mom. No, they did not. In fact, um, is it fair to say that they killed her with the kitchen knife from her own knife block? I believe they did, yes. Okay. Um, And you wrote letters while you were in custody for this offense. Is that correct? Yes. You wrote many, many letters to your friends and family members, correct? Uh, mainly family members, yes. Okay, specifically you wrote letters to Jean. Yes. And you wrote letters to your brother Rob? Yes. Okay, and you told them that it wouldn't be unlikely that your fingerprints would be on that knife, correct? From the standpoint that we all used the knives in the kitchen, I lived in the house, it, it very well could be on there. I all don't right. know. Did, did you uh, tell him... Um, any fingerprints that may exist are easily explained um, as the dumbbells were mine. Did you tell him that? Yes, I did. And I regularly use the knife in question to prepare food, correct? Yes, I did. Um, and you said you worked out three to four times per month and you were living there for 10 months, so it would not be hard to explain that evidence away if it were to appear. Correct, because I knew what the murder weapons were because I saw the gentleman who used them, absolutely. Okay, but you never told him anything about the two guys who came into the house with guns and bludgeoned your mother to death. See this? This is important. You would think that while in police custody for his mother's murder, a murder he claims he didn't commit because two strangers just so happened to kill her the day he was supposed to report to prison, you would think that he would tell his friends and family what actually happened. He would want to unburden himself of their distrust and show that he didn't actually do the crime he's being accused of. You would also think he would now want to warn them of the danger they are supposedly in. But instead of doing that, he tried to justify why his DNA would be present at the scene of the crime and why his fingerprints would be on the weapons. You really don't have that kind of capacity to write from being incarcerated. I told him the key facts. Oh, okay. You told him the key facts that two guys broke into your mother's house? I don't recall if I told him that or not. Okay. And in fact, what you actually told him is... Uh, The timing and substance of this disclosure will all make sense. Yes, because I knew that I didn't do it, and I would have to sit here in my defense one day, absolutely. But you never said anything to Janine about um, these two guys who were supposedly out and knew her whereabouts in any of these letters, right? Janine wasn't reading anything I sent her. Okay, and what about your brother? You never said, listen... 
Um, these two guys are out. Um, they've got photographs of our family on the phone, and you need to look into this. You need to do something and keep everyone safe. I had absolutely no confidence that law enforcement would do anything at that point because they took out the warrant for the murder of my mother the same day they found the body and investigated nobody else. But there was no need to investigate anyone else based on the crime scene and the circumstances. All the DNA that was found at the scene of the crime belonged to Richard and his mother. No neighbors stated they saw anyone suspicious or out of place when the murders took place. And no one person besides Richard had ever claimed that two men dressed suspiciously had been anywhere near the home at the time of the murder. Not only that, but he failed to call law enforcement and went on the run, spending eight months living under a different identity. He's trying to state that the suspicion being placed on him by law enforcement is unjustified, when in reality, it would be ridiculous to ignore him as a suspect. He had means, motive, and opportunity, but he wants us to ignore all of that, because he, the criminal who stole half a million dollars from the elderly, swears he wouldn't have done this. Okay, and um, you never, you, you did take, so you said you took your mother's car, right? Yes. And you took your mother's phone as well, right? Yes, I did. And um, that, that doesn't make really a lot of sense. Can you explain why you took your mother's phone? I took my phone, of course, and I took her phone because of all the calls we had been getting on both my phone and her phone. I assumed that these were the same folks who had been calling us that had killed her. They might have some sort of demands. Janine might call my phone or my mother's phone if these guys made a move on her or the kids. And I wanted to know exactly what was going on. That's why I took both phones. You've seen the phone records that the state admitted into evidence, didn't you? Of course. Okay, both you um, and, and you've had the opportunity to review those phone records, right? Yes. And there were phone calls made to both your phone and your mother's phone while you were on the run, right? Uh, if... I don't recall anybody calling me while I was on my phone anyway. Okay. She may have received some texts. A lot of those were SMS, not necessarily phone calls. You never picked up any phone calls to your mother's phone on February 1st, 2019, did you? No, but if I recall correctly, the calls that came in were people in her contact, so I had no worries that they were the ones who killed her. Okay. And you got rid of those phones? Yes. You got rid of them before you even cut the ankle monitor off, or around the time that you cut the ankle monitor yes, off. Yes, I, I don't dispute the data or your expert. So there was never any intent to turn them over to the police so that they could see whether anyone was after your mom or asking for demands, as, as you mentioned before. No, because I took them at their word. Say nothing or this will happen to your family. Okay. Um, Richard is pretty wild. Again, to be responding to the prosecution like this, as if what she's saying is ridiculous, is lunacy, especially when he's blatantly telling the jury, in this case, that he had evidence that everything he was saying is true, but he destroyed all the evidence while on the run. Sure, there's no proof that anything I'm saying happened, and no one can corroborate my story, but trust me, would I, a man who's going to prison for fraud and elder abuse, really do this? So whose idea was it to turn, turn Jeff Coat, Mike Jeffcoat, down that morning? It was actually my mother's suggestion. She says, I don't really need Mike to come today. And I said, okay, as long as you're able to drive and get yourself back. All right. That was the extent of the conversation. All right. And, um, but you, both you and she texted Mike. Are you aware of that? Of course. Okay. Um, you went to Nashville. Is that the first place you went? Or did you stop anywhere else along the way? I believe I stopped in... Chattanooga to use the bathroom at a Walmart. Okay. Um, and you spent those entire eight months in Nashville, right? Yes. All right. Um, you, and let, let's be clear, the name you used was McMalvo. Where did that name come from? The alias that I used was from New Orleans. It was a Cajun sounding name. That's why I picked it. All right, and you made this driver's license, State's Exhibit 82, yourself, right? Uh, yeah, I got the template online, yes. Okay, and you actually had the sleeves that you put driver's licenses in, or at least the kind that you put this in, in your car when it was collected, right? I printed it off and believe the business card, plastic laminates, that's, that's what I got. All right, and even the birth date on this is incorrect. 
Yes. All right. Because it says here that you were born on February 25th of 1980, right? Correct. When actually your birthday is February 23rd, 1974. That's right. Okay. So you subtracted six years on your age because you didn't want to get caught. I did not want to get found and have my family hurt as a result. I was trying to disappear to protect them. Hey guys, come on, please. I really wanted to go to prison for 15 years, but the day I was supposed to report in to begin my sentence, I was forced to go on the run. Not because I wanted to avoid prison time, but because two unknown men were going to murder my whole family if I were to get justice for the crimes I committed. Makes a lot of sense, and it's pretty noble when you really think about it. All right. Um, but you did go on to a dating app and meet women on that, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so you didn't have any concern about putting your, your um, information out on a, on a dating app, did you? Well, what information specifically? Any of it. Well, I wasn't putting information out there as Richard Merritt. Okay. All right. Um, and did you speak with a New Orleans accent to Kelly? No. All right. And you were never a marketing executive. Right? No, I was not. That was just something you made up to create this new persona of Mick Malvo. Yes, that's correct. All right, and you did not go to LSU. No. You were a Georgia fan. I went to Georgia, yes. Yeah, and Georgia. you weren't an LSU fan. No. And you were not a Saints fan. Actually, I have been a Saints fan my whole life. Okay. Um, but you put those stickers on your mother's car as part of this persona of Mick Malva. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so that was part of the deception. Is that right? I would call it protection. All right. And you also put a stolen license plate on your mom's car. This is true. I did. All right. So that was part of the lie as well, because you didn't want to be found by these monsters. Absolutely right. Or the cops. That would lead to the monsters. Absolutely right. Okay, and you said that you were staying with cousins in Nashville, correct? I believe that is something I said, yes. But that's not true either. Is it? No, it wasn't true. You, you didn't have any cousins or family in Nashville? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay, and so you didn't really have a place to stay in Nashville? Not at first, no. Okay, until you met Kelly? Correct. So you were using her for a place to live, is that right? I wouldn't go that far, no. Okay. Um, you told Kelly that you did not have any kids, correct? That's true. I and did. you said you had a niece, though, with cerebral palsy. I did. And you never said anything about um, any kind of nephew, right? No, I did not. You said that your mom had died of leukemia. Is that a lie that you told him? I, that's what I told him. Okay. Um, and... You grew your hair and beard out while you were there? Yes. And again, that was part of the persona of Mick Malvo because you didn't want to get caught by these alleged monsters, right? Yes, that's And true. you didn't want to get arrested either. Well, that would definitely lead to compromising my family, yes. All right. Mr. Merritt... When you originally stole money from your clients, you stole, what, about $500,000, more or less, right? Yes, correct. Um, and most of these clients were elderly. Not most of them, about a third. About a third, okay. Um, are you aware that the average age of the clients who are, chart who are listed as your victims in the indictment is 61.2 years old? I wasn't specifically targeting the elderly. I believe the law states that 65 and older is... Elder exploitation. Oh. Again, he's incredibly smug in his replies back to her, and it's not making him look good. He tries to one-up her and claim he didn't actually target the elderly, even though he absolutely did. Previously stated his practice worked mostly with the elderly in the direct examination, and when she points out that the majority of his victims were over 61, he tries to fight back with technicalities. This entire time he's been on the stand, he was supposed to come off as extremely timid and incapable of hurting the people around him, but he's failed so spectacularly that I can't even put it into words. Okay, most of your victims were in their 60s and 70s. Is that right? I really don't know the numbers, man. Okay, and they had been injured in car accidents and other kind of insurance claims. That's, that's, that's kind of the 
meat of the folks that you were representing and that you stole from. Is that right? That's correct. And you would tell them you 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 would you would settle their claims with the insurance company and not tell the clients that you had settled, right? That's what I did. And so you would take their money from the insurance company and keep it as your own, right? Well, it would be put back into the firm for the most part, but yes. Okay. And you also promised to put some money in your escrow account for certain clients, right? Yes. And again, you didn't put any of that money in an escrow account. Pled to all of this in January of 2018. Okay, and you did this because the firm was in trouble. It was, yes. Okay. It was in trouble. So is it fair to say, Mr. Merritt, that when you're in trouble, you lie to try to get out of it? I don't believe that's fair to say at all. Oh. Yes, it is. Okay. Is it fair to say that when your firm was in trouble, you deceived many of your clients, at least the 17 listed in the indictment? That is correct. I pled to that, yes. Okay. And is it fair to say that you deceived the people who you worked with and worked for at Betty's Grill as to your name and where you were from and who you were? Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, and is it fair to say that you made up an entire story and told a lie to Kelly Richardson because that would be a convenient way for you to get what you needed at that time. I genuinely cared for Kelly. I didn't need her for a place to stay. Okay, and yet your entire relationship with her was a lie. Parts of it, yes. Okay. So is it fair to say that you have lied and deceived to get out of trouble in the past. I don't think that's fair to say. Okay. Okay, so the day of February 1st, 2019, these two guys came in, they killed your mother with her kitchen knife and your weight, right? Yes, they were my weights. And they um, didn't steal anything from the house. I don't know if they did or not. Okay. And um, they didn't break in. You said that you let them in yourself. No, I'm not aware that they tried to break in before. Okay. And they had never tried to break in prior to that. I can't say... Who tried to break it at any given point? I okay. I don't know. Because nobody, as far as you know, had tried to break into your house prior to that. I'm not aware of anybody trying to break in, no. Okay. But they did not leave a scratch on you. They roughed me up a little bit going down the stairs, but no, they did. Okay. And you were the person who they were after, right? I'm quite certain that that was their intent when they came there, yes. Okay. But they just let you go scot-free. I believe when my mother started to get loud, that's when the gentleman pushed her, and then he finished her off so she wouldn't make any noise. That's what I personally think, and they didn't realize what they got into, and they took off. I don't know what their real intentions were. We never got that far. Okay. They never pulled the triggers of either of those guns. No, they did not. Okay. And there was no struggle that caused any furniture to tip over, right? I don't call any no. Okay. Where did they get that knife from? I believe they got it from the butcher block in the kitchen. Okay. I don't have anything further. No, you After his cross-examination, the defense rested their case. In closing arguments were said the following day, Richard had believed that he put on a stellar performance. Sure, he didn't cry or seem like he really cared about his mom that much, but he told the jury what to believe, and he felt that that was enough. He expected to be fully exonerated for all of his crimes and to walk out a free man. However, less than an hour later, the jury had reached their verdict. Guilty on all counts. 
in the Superior Court of DeKalb County, State of Georgia, State of Georgia versus Richard Vincent Merritt, defendant, indictment number 19CR2141-4, Judge Courtney L. Johnson. Verdict form, as of count one, malice murder, we the jury find the defendant guilty. As of count two, felony murder, <clears throat> we the jury find the defendant guilty. As of count three, felony murder, we the jury find the defendant guilty. As of count four, aggravated assault, we the jury find the defendant guilty. As of count five, aggravated assault. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. As of count six, possession of knife during commission of a felony. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. Before receiving his sentence, Richard addressed the court. She shall give in the case now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you God. Yes, ma'am, I do. Mr. Merritt, before you say anything, I want to make sure that you understand that you do have the right to appeal your conviction in this uh, case. I am going to give you some more instructions about your appeal rights once we've concluded with the sentencing hearing, um, but I'm sure that Mr. Queen has discussed this with you, but I do want to make sure that I reiterate that to you for the record. Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? Yes. Your Honor, I realize that words aren't going to adequately convey what has occurred throughout the past week and the previous several years. I was raised right by two very good people, beautiful people, my mother and father. I had a beautiful family that I've lost. I've long since lost them. I lost them in the Cobb County case. Things were never the same after the arrest. I had, as I said, a beautiful family, beautiful children, a beautiful wife, inside and out, all of them. The world was was truly our oyster, and I blew it. I just fell victim to the ultimate drug there is, and that's the green drug money, and it led to just bad behavior and bad choices. And my life spiraled out of control and I couldn't get it back. I am immensely sorry for the pain that this entire process has caused. I realize it's been very uncomfortable for my family, those who used to be my friends, extended family, everybody who ever cared about me. And I was blessed to have a lot of people that did. And most of them are gone now. Maybe they'll come back in my life one day. I don't know. I have to earn that back somehow. I accept the court's sentence, whatever it may be. I respect, despite how poorly I treated the profession I was so lucky to be a part of, I, I respect the system. I respect justice and the jury's verdict. I certainly understand my rights of appeal and will pursue that accordingly, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about. We all wish things could be different, but I can't go back and change anything. Um, as I said, I, I just, it's, it's a very surreal experience to be sitting here and um, words aren't going to do any good and I just want my family to know as, as I sit here now that I wish none of us had to go through it and endure the pain of this entire ordeal and I hope that one day when they're ready if they're ready, that I'd be blessed to have them in some form of my life. I have not had a single interaction with either one of my children 
since being arrested in Nashville. I have no idea what their lives are like. I really have no idea what they look like, what their day-to-day -day life is like. And I know it's hard for a lot of people to believe this, but I, I do love them more than anything, and I miss them terribly. I'm not trying to interfere in their lives, and certainly that being a part of it, it's a little bit difficult in prison. I've been in prison now two and a half years. Before that, I was stuck in DeKalb County 14 months in COVID, so I've been incarcerated in almost four years. I know how hard it is, and I know how it changes people. But nevertheless, I'm going to try to be a better person and realize that life is a blessing, whatever form it may take, even a very difficult situation such as what I'm facing right now. I appreciate the court's time. Following his self-serving semi-apology, Richard was sentenced to life in prison. Again, this case is an example of misplaced confidence and how someone can truly delude themselves into believing their own idiotic ideas. If you liked this video and would like to see more of our content, consider subscribing. If you're interested in supporting the channel, our Patreon will be linked below. But as always, I hope you have a great day and remember to stay safe.